I want to introduce Moya Bailey. We have a very special guest tonight, and I was going to give a short introduction, but Moya, being much more prepared than me, has prepared an appropriate uh, uh, introduction of our special guest, Anita Frazier. Um, but I will introduce Moya, and I will say, you know, I love you, and we are so glad that you're here. Um, Demita Frazier is very dear to us in the black feminist community, but of course in the larger uh, freedom and justice community, and uh, uh, Moya's introduction, you will see why. But I also want to introduce my other interlocutor. Hey, Prexy Nesbitt and Emily. <laughs> Emily was the first staff person of the Social Justice Initiative, so we got <laughs> it would not exist. Um, so Moya Bailey, uh, was an undergraduate student at Spelman College, went on to get her PhD at uh, Emory. She wrote a book called Massage Noir, uh, Black Women and Digital Resistance. And she also coined the term Massage Noir. And of course, it's misogyny and noir uh, that is the hostility, the violent uh, antagonism toward black women. Um, and she's been very much a part of many black feminist responses to that from the Punk Feminist Collective uh, which made interventions in hip hop culture to um, view feminist engaged Wikipedia uh, to the Octavia Butler Legacy uh, Project. And so uh, her generation of, of young feminist scholars, we are very proud of her. I don't proud sounds presumptuous. So <laughs> we, um, we learn a lot from her. Um, she is really uh, not only a scholar, but also an activist and an organizer. And so I'm glad to be an interlocutor with the two of them this afternoon, and you will have a chance for questions. And uh, Bettina and me, I think, have uh, cards at the back. So the way we wanted to do the questions is have people write the questions on cards. It seemed a little more organized way to do it. They'll pass them up here, and uh, we will respond to them. So thank you all for coming out, and let's start the conversation. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I just want to, you sort of introduced yourself, but not really. And so I'm going to tell just a little story of uh, meeting Barbara as an undergraduate at Spelman College. And Barbara was doing work on Ella Baker and introduced this idea of Ella, Ella's daughters to us. And that was my first introduction really was <laughs> successfully, successfully. And so the, the young women who were part of that conversation remain friends today. So I just want to say thank you for sparking that spark. Uh, just want to start with, as you know, we are in Chicago, part of the traditional and seated homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Minimini, Sac, and Fox, also call this area home. I was really moved by a non-land acknowledgement in which indigenous elders made clear that land acknowledgements are not enough and they can be used to help white supremacy to relax. And while we're not interested in helping white supremacy relax, it can be easy to forget that our ability to gather here together is due in part to indigenous communities who have maintained relationships with the land that settler colonialism actively works to obscure. This land has been irrevocably, irrevocably <laughs> altered via global warming or the more socially acceptable climate change, as we're saying these days. Uh, we are on track to have the longest February in Chicago's history. In thinking about settler colonialism, I like Barbara, cannot go on without acknowledging the genocide unfolding against the Palestinian people or the ethnic cleansing transpiring in the Sudan. May we continue to pressure our government and institutions to call for a ceasefire. In addition to acknowledging the traditional stewards of the land we are on, I work to make sure that my research supports the descendants of those whose enslaved labor make a space like this possible. So acknowledging the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who have enriched this region with cultural and economic contributions that can never truly be quantified. May we add to this remembrance and acknowledgement of the Congolese miners mining minerals that power 
our digital devices and make the tech of our institutions and daily lives possible. So in an ongoing war, pandemic, amidst genocide, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and ecological devastation, it can be overwhelming to think about doing business as usual. So I want to think about our time together as a little pocket of possibility, a buoyant bubble, and a world on fire. With this in mind, I'd like to introduce Demita with a non-traditional bio. So when the pandemic started, I started writing these bios for friends on Facebook on their birthdays. And so it was a way to talk about them and get other people to be excited about my friends' birthdays. I know a little bit about them. So this is Demita's. It's Demita Frazier's birthday. And honestly, you may need more than a day to celebrate this mischievous marvel of a human, which would suit this Leo just fine. Just make sure you've got your own oyster knife and are ready for a stream of consciousness walk and wander through nature and your mind. Jack of all trades doesn't even really begin to cover all the areas where Demita has skill. Did I mention a bitch can burn? Like, if she weren't too busy theorizing and organizing for black feminist liberation, she'd feed us all Michelin star meals that would leave us seated and ready for revolution. Listen, I know people talk about Aretha Franklin's cooking, but this one right here. So go for a walk, laugh till you cry, and personify Black Don't Crack in honor of the one and only Demita Frazier. <laughs> You said you were going to do the thing and you did it. Thank and I, you. you're welcome. You're welcome. So, how could I not have let her do her introduction? You know, <laughs> it all worked out perfectly. Indeed. It really did. Indeed. And so, with that kind of in mind, thinking about where we are, I want to throw out to both of you how do the cities of Chicago and Boston play a role in your activist and organizing lives? Love that question. First of all, I have to say, can you hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. I can sing and I used to project a lot. So I'm assuming you can hear me despite oh but they're trying to record it. Oh right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um first of all, thank you so much for masking my allegiance and my alliance right now to the immunocompromised and people who cannot be in these spaces with us because we have to be able to take care of them. Our lack of care as a society is truly upsetting. And I really want to talk about my folks on the left because I'm like, you know, y'all are just as bad as everybody else. Not y'all, but you know what I mean, none of y'all, okay? I think what's really also important about this conversation is that, like Moya said, in a world on fire, everything we do that brings us into closer communication around these subjects that really matter that relate to the fire, is a, contra, is a contra indicated by the dominant paradigm. So when we do this, we're breaking, I hate to use this word, karma, because it's not the correct way to use the word, but the idea that we're having this conversation, which is not supported, urged, or encouraged by the dominant society, makes us revolutionary in this moment, just by having the conversation, especially it's looking at the kinds of conversations that are happening in the dominant paradigm now. So, Chicago. Um, I love my city in a way that's almost embarrassing sometimes. I've been in Boston for 50 years and I'm moving back to Chicago. Yeah. I can't even talk to you because part of what it, one of the reasons why I'm moving back is because of a place to age. I want to be in community with other people who have the capacity to think outside the box, to think beyond, and also to still cause trouble and shake shit up. <laughs> and Chicago, no matter what, we're always doing that. <laughs> and, and it's also interesting for me, I just learned this word, I'm going to add it to my lexicon. I'm a, a proud, shy, I'm a shy Sicipian. I'm a hybrid. I was born in Chicago to a southern black mother from Mississippi. And let me tell you, <laughs> you have plumbed the depths of what that all means. <laughs> I, I could not be here, ironically, if I had not had that 
I don't know, a kneeling kind of experience because it was both bittersweet, educative, daunting, and challenging. When you really, and, and the other thing too about being in Chicago, being from Chicago from the 1950s, there was a richness to the culture here that I don't think people really understand. When people talk about all the time, they talk about the Harlem Renaissance and you know all of that. And I'm like, yeah, excellent. 20s, excellent. But the 50s here, post-World War II, when I say things were popping, and I was just a type, I mean, I was little, but my parents, who were not political people, but who were like a lot of African-American people, political-minded, and thinking about what's going on here, how am I fitting in here, what are they, what are they doing now? <laughs> and so, having been raised in this rich cultural milieu that was going on all around me, my father worked as a bartender, and he worked for two clubs in Chicago the Club de Lisa and the Queen's Mansions. And because he worked in these trans, in these black nightclubs that drew black intellectuals, Dick Gregory, by the way, is my godfather. May he rest in peace. Um, but he was a, just a young teacher learning, but hanging out in the clubs at night practicing his art. Other people, the singers, gay, straight, and otherwise, who all came through Chicago during the 50s and the early 60s. These were people who had to be one way, talk about code switching, be one way with their downtown at the whatever hotel or whatever club. Or and then after that close, they would come to the South Side. And there'd be music and dancing and all kinds of frivolity until the same in the morning. By the way, Chicago is the home of the breakfast restaurant culture. When your clubs don't close till five, you better have some breakfast ready. And it's interesting, when I go to other cities, it's like, don't you have that culture? Like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, they do not. And I could go through an entire list of many of the things that helped to make me who I am, but the most important thing I want to tell you is that, not related to Chicago per se, but related to the experience of black ancestors, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, who found a kind of freedom in Chicago that they could not have in Mississippi, and the way in which they embraced the possibilities is breathtaking. When I think about it, you didn't have to be, um, even though I am intellectual, you didn't have to be that to be a person who moved past moving, moving and shaking in the community. The natural intellectual capacity with an analysis of looking at like, why is our situation the way that it is? How can we make it better? They were always on that because they had already experienced what it was like to not be on that. I think one of the other things that really benefited me in terms of my own development was just the timing of being born at a time when the cultures, not one culture, but all the cultures, were going through tremendous tumult. So the 1950s, let's be really honest, the civil rights movement is not over. There's no post anything. We're not post feminist, post written. No, it's all still happening. When I was coming up as a small child, when I was three years old and Emmett Till was murdered in Money, Mississippi, I was only three, but I was already reading by then. I don't know, I don't remember not reading. My father did that to me. I remember my mother's cry, and I had never, I only heard it once in my life. The way she sounded, I can, I have this, but she's talking about it now, because there was something beyond with that murder. And it wasn't as if they had not seen, my, one of my uncles was lynched in Mississippi, my great uncle. So it wasn't as if violence and, and extrajudicial violence wasn't happening. But there was something about that case that really struck black people in Chicago. And I remember distinctly, um, my mother was not a person who went to meetings, but she did go to a, meet, to a few meetings after that happened because she wanted to be with other people who could talk about that situation freely. So having exposure to people who were finding their own freedom and power without using words like I'm looking for my own freedom and power, there was nothing you know, performative about any of it, was a real lesson for me. And I'm the only one of my, of my siblings who's a weirdo like me. I mean, everybody else is not political, not at all, just trying to live their lives. But I took a lot of things, for, I took a lot of things very seriously. And I remember being small and thinking about power. I remember thinking about, and I said this earlier today in one of the lectures, it's like, I was always questioning authority before there was a t-shirt. I was always like, how can you talk about respecting adults when you all respect children? Make it make sense. And I was tolerated 
Because I was one of those weird black children. It's like, what is she going to say next? <laughs> why is she asking? Why are you asking that question? Why not? So much related to how I was experiencing what it was like to be in this body, to be and never, ever, ever getting a message of you're a girl and you should be doing the following three things and that's it. The lectures are strong and harsh. You better get that education because they can't take that away from you. And I think it was that delightful lawyer in Atlanta who's got you all causing that trouble for the clown. You know what I'm talking about. When she said, a man is not a plan, I almost lost my mind. <laughs> it was like my mother sat up in the cosmos and said, see, I told you. <laughs> the ways in which we were encouraged as young women, my sister and I, to be fully in charge of our lives and to have agency, and they don't use any words like agency and having charge. Take care of your business, and don't expect other people to take care of you. It has up and down sides, because you gotta learn how to let people like, come into your life. But I say that to say, my origins as a feminist, as a black feminist, come from, from the roots of black women knowing that they did the work, and they were doing the work, they were raising the kids, they were doing the job, they were going to work, coming home, cooking, not complaining because we all had to eat. And I think one of the things that, that I learned from her, my mother particularly, is that the ways in which we were taught to be, because there was always mixed messages, you know, sometimes you might hear from some relative, you know, children are meant to be seen but not heard. Um, it was kind of a joke in the family that my mother's looking, whenever that got said, my mother would look at me like, okay. <laughs> what is she gonna do now? What is she gonna do? And I guess what I'm doing, I'm sorry to wander a bit, but I, Chicago also, because I was part of the integration of the public high schools in the 1960s, the so-called permissive transfer program said high school, 5900 North Glenwood, took me an hour and a half to get to school every day. I won't tell you that it was a perfect experience at all, but it was really right for me because I got a quick baptism on what racism, gender violence, the, the agony of trying to engage across culture, it was writ large. And that's why now when people say, we're depending on the young people to help us, they're gonna take care of things, and we're like, no, that's not what's happening. There are young fascists everywhere. <laughs> Every, I, I'm saltier than Lot's wife, so there may be some, some swears that slip out, okay? We are, all the mythologies about what it means to be a young person and how people want to load that onto people. And it's like, no, you do some work. You still got time. Do your work. Stop trying to push it off onto younger people. And especially because when we were jumping up and popping up and doing all the, they were like, you need to go sit down. You got to stop it. Who asked you? All of that. Um, one final thing, food. <laughs> The one thing that I really took away, and we took this into comedy, is because we didn't have the commodified, the commodified culture of self-care, we did the things that we were taught to do to survive, that we learned from grandmothers and aunties, etc. Keep your house clean. Make sure you put some food on the table that's worth eating. Make sure you get your rest, because when you go out there in the world again tomorrow, it's going to be a war all over again. So you needed to have your bodily strength. You needed to have certain things be happening in your life so that you could deal with what's going on outside. Now we have to buy it all and we have to sell it all. And it's like, don't make it complicated. Change your sheets. <laughs> I won't tell you why I said that, but I told you twice to go there. And we had to stop for like 50, 10 minutes because I had a story to tell and it was shocking. <laughs> I just couldn't even understand how she could not change her sheets in a year. See? And I'm like, basic knowledge, like, what are we doing? What are we doing out here? And so, all comedy aside, I think the other thing I want to say, just in, in stopping, I know I've been going on for a bit, I think the other thing besides being part of integration and being part of the integrated movement in the city, it was also teaching me a lot about racism in Chicago. So much so that I was having a very difficult time thinking about staying here, which is why I moved. Um, Chicago felt overwhelming in terms of trying to do political organizing. I had been a part of the Black Panther Party here in the 60s as a teenager. And you saw what happened. So there was trauma. Then I remember when we were trying to do some organizing about other issues in the city, race was always a divider. Not 
deeply but often. And I wanted to be someplace that didn't have that heavy weight. And Chicago being the second city, I mean, it's significant economically, politically, culturally. And Boston seemed like a little bit of a backwater, so it was manageable. <laughs> They don't like to think about themselves that way, as we know. <laughs> Golden City on the Hill and all that, but it was more manageable. And there was a strong feminist movement, including a lot of black feminists living in Chicago. So it made the idea of organizing in Chicago, I'm sorry, organizing in Boston better. I think that's it. Chicago has been, I'm still like not over how wonderful we are. <laughs> we really are. So did that help you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Okay, Moya sprung this on me. I was supposed to be kind of asking them questions, and Moya slipped in the script here a little bit. I'll be free. Um, when you say you're a, a, a chai Sisyphean, chai -Sisyphean. I guess I'm a deep chai Sisyphean because I was in Detroit, Chicago, but my mother was also, as I mentioned to you earlier, from Mississippi. Um, but thinking of Chicago and um, and I'll say Boston too, I have a, I have a Boston moment. But, <laughs> My partner got his nose broken on the beach in Boston fighting racists in 1975. So when you say Boston was a more <laughs> more hospitable, um, yeah, no, no, didn't greet us no. so well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. In 1975, we never restore our right, our alienated rights. The racist uh, those are the busing uh, folks. Yeah. We were staying up nights in people's houses yeah. to watch for people coming to Boston. I know so you are. I know you are. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so you know the Chicago, the racism of Chicago, the racism of Boston is the backdrop against like, you know what's being organized. And also, I would say you know when I came to Chicago, Craig Sinez was sitting over there. Um, was one of the first people I organized with, which was around the anti-apartheid for South Africa movement, mm -hmm. um, which was very vibrant in Chicago. And um, and then you know we had the Black Radical Congress here. African American Women in Defense of Ourselves was founded here. And, uh, most recently, this campaign to elect the progressive mayor, and we're still learning what that means and what it doesn't mean. So, um, and what's possible, and what's possible, and what seemingly isn't. So, you know, it's it's not it's not that can't be our only arena of struggle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I would say about Chicago. I mean, Detroit is a whole other story. You know, there was we had the Black Panther Party in Detroit when I was a teenager, which was kind of my introduction to politics, and some radical nuns who introduced me to Central America solidarity work. But um, feminism came here, uh, came really before before Chicago, but when I was in New York, um, and uh, through comrades in South Africa, comrades in New York, um, really connecting all the dots in terms of what racial capitalism and patriarchy had in common among them, and that we had to defeat both. So I'll stop there. Can we ask you a question, Moya? Yes, you yeah. can, but I, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I think, you know, when I, when I think of, um, Demita has, Moya alluded to Demita's various uh, skill sets and, and identities, and Demita's also a lawyer. Uh, I think it'd be more at, Recovering. As, a, as a part of the art, artistic, artistic radical movement rather than the legal radical movement. Uh, but I also think of Moya as a cultural worker and interventionist. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about that, the question of culture and how how your understanding of culture, both you know, racist culture, patriarchal culture, but resilient culture of resistance yeah. fits into you know your sense of yourself as an organizer and do we find some hope and optimism in that in this moment? Welcome. <laughs> I knew she had a good answer, so I don't ask questions well, people can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> This actually takes me back to the culture of Spelman College and the little space that the Women's Center provided for us and the fact that he came and so many other people, Kathy Cohen came, uh, held hopes to used to come. There was a sense that we could see how activism, scholarship all went together. It wasn't separate for us. And we also had a conference that we did every year that the students run called the Tony Cape Rivera Conference, which was started by a student. And Tony Cape Rivera had taught one of the first Black women writers classes at an HBCU. And 
that's just infused in terms of how I think about culture. And it being in the South created a sense of always thinking about food. How are we holding and creating space, creating the container? And that our activism was always connected to who we were and how we were living. So I think that's a huge part of a cultural message of what organizing can be, because for us, it was also nourishing. And I think when you're talking about the left, I think that's one of the issues that young people are experiencing now is not feeling like there is a, a door there on the left, a culture or a sense of uh, nourishing. It does feel sometimes like people are um, waiting to tear each other down in some way. And something, uh, one of the courses that I'm teaching at Northwestern, I taught a course called Cults, Communes, and Congregations. And we were talking about why people are attracted to those different mediums and what the church provides that often the left doesn't. And so that, that nourishing spirit I think is so central to the kind of culture that we actually want to go towards. And Spelman to me, in that little space that we have here, the Women's Center, and what I imagine SGI can be for students at UIC, it becomes a space where people can create the culture that they want to see and how they interact with each other. I will be brief this time. <laughs> okay. Jazz music, the only creative music that's been created by this culture, shaped my political thinking as a child. My father was friends with Theolonius Monk, and nobody liked him. I mean, I can't even tell you. The conversations you overhear when adults aren't paying attention if you're listening to them. Are amazing. I still remember many times, you know, the, what was, why was there beef? Why was there a problem? Because there was a way in which he, John Coltrane, and some others, including Abby Lincoln and, uh, and women, women performers, who were adamantly anti racist and were also, I would think, consider them supremely cult, black cultural workers. Um, just being surrounded by the music and then hearing the people, the, the adults talking, the murmuring voices later, and talking about the music. Something in jazz music is very freeing. And it meant for me, I used to fall asleep to jazz radio in Chicago in the 1950s as a kid. I don't know what it did to me, but it really did make me question all authority and make me feel like there's a freedom that's there. I am a singer, but not, but yeah, so many things. I mean, that was the one thing too about um, the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s, is there was a space to explore yourself in all those ways. And I think what's really interesting about being a singer is because I didn't learn to sing in church. I sang in the Sin High School Choir as a chorus. Our, we had so many enemies, you know, Sullivan, all those other high schools, because we kept winning. But the thing that was so because and because we were the most integrated schools, we had a real variety of voices at Sin. The thing I want to say about the way culture works is that as black feminists, we immediately, as we were starting to come together, shared the things that really mattered to us, which was black music and black culture, shaking it, dancing, sorry. Just being able to be social in a certain kind of way in the midst of organizing. We also organized a lot. I've got a lot of really wonderful support mentoring by a woman who is just an amazing thinker on South Africa. And she introduced me to the movement against apartheid, and she was part of the Polaroid, um, the Polaroid film boycott that went on for years. And I want to tell you what's really fascinating to me is that there was always music, drumming and dancing at every event that was held. So the the, the corporality, the, the way of having the body be represented in the room and the voice, along with theory and talking was amazing. And it wasn't something that I found outside of certain circles that related to political activity. Believe me, SDS was not doing that. Not at all. And I remember, I mean, others I didn't mention. So 
there was something about the way in which I noticed that black people incorporated a fullness of culture and talked about how that culture and representation of culture was a powerful, had a powerful impact, not on the larger world acknowledging our brilliance and our genius, but that we were able to transmit that to each other and in the communities we were in. I hung out with the people who were in the AACM, Joseph Jarmon and those folks, that couldn't work out because of one of the things I discovered about hanging out with black men who were musicians, it can be tricky. I won't say more. <laughs> oh, and only because again, I was a political creature and I was really looking for there to be that political in interest everywhere I went. The really important thing about all of this is to say black women dance companies, black women musicians, we had that in Chicago in, ample, in, an, in an ample way. And it meant that that was just another way of having agency and it being expressive. And that was important for my young mind because there wasn't any repression at home. But one of the things I was encountering as I went out into the so-called larger world was realizing there were people that didn't know anything about black people and they considered themselves to be educated people. I'll never forget at Sen High School, this boy tried to play me and he said, I bet you don't know what gestalt means. I started reading the dictionary when I was five. I, I mean, and I'm not joking, when I say I read the dictionary, I really like. When I discovered all the words were in there, I was like, oh, this is for me. All the words are in this book. But what really got me was the things that you stumble on when you're looking at it, when you're reading through a dictionary. It tells you so much about the writers of the dictionary, about where you are culturally at the time, what's included, what's not included. I don't know how I picked up on these things, but I did. And the point I'm really going to try to make, and I'm going to stop here with this, is to say there was an encouragement to rebel that people didn't want to encourage too much because being a rebellious black child in America is dangerous. I mean, all day long. But there was also this sort of the secret knowledge factory that I used to think about. It's like the, top, the conversations you have with mom after a bath. And my mother was not an intellectual, but she was an observant, savvy, smart woman. And she would say things like, did you ever notice? And then she'd go on and say something. And what she was doing was teaching me to be observant. Pay attention. She would say that to my sister more than me because Audrey is not paying attention, but I did. I took it very seriously. And that's another thing. Those, that encouragement, that, that sort of structure that was not, I don't know, it wasn't, what I'm trying to say, I'm searching for the word. They didn't get it from a book. They didn't learn it in an institution. These were hard learned lessons and observations from life. And it had real meaning. I, I just took it really seriously. So did I answer the question? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to go. You know I could get one. Oh, good. And and I actually want to uh, ask you a question, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> this question is sort of related to the impact of Kumbaki. Do you remember when you first read the statement, how you first encountered the statement, and then also what it's been like to teach with it? Or teach around it. Yeah, great. Um, I do. I do remember. I was in a feminist study group, mm -hmm. and uh, we, I don't know what year it was, uh, but I was in New York, and I was in New York from so it must have been nineteen. I think it was nineteen eighty. Um, Time is always like Yeah, but. Um, but there was a study group, and I'd been in a larger political organization that there was a feminist caucus within the organization that was um, pushing the organization around issues of gender and sexuality. And so we read the Kombiki statement. And then um, and I you know, didn't teach it right away because I wasn't teaching, I was in graduate school. Um, but then, no, I was an undergraduate. Um, but then I remember in 1984, for the Feminist and the Scholar Conference at Barnard, um, which was one of the more controversial ones. Um, Barbara Smith and I, because I had been active in the anti-apartheid movement on campus, Barbara Smith and I were on a, a panel together and we had a long bonding conversation over Kompiki, about Kompiki and she told me stories and we became fast friends. And so, you know, when I went off to Ann Arbor, I began to teach it. And 
you know, I think one of the things, you know, people read a document um, or a text and they see what they want to see. I'm just writing a preface to the 20th, 20 year anniversary edition of the Elevate the Book. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about how people have taught that book and the things they focus on and the things that are in there, they look at me and say, really? She was a social? <laughs> you know, because I think if you read Kompiki, all of the disparaging things that get said about so-called identity politics, the black feminism is divisive, black feminism is about a narrow culture. It is about radical inclusivity. Absolutely. It is about how we are, none of us are any one dimensional thing, right? And it's about identity is not enough. And it is anti-imperialist, it is anti-capitalist, it is so clear yeah. um, in all of those ways that are kind of, as you were talking about more, which we might crudely say bourgeois feminism um, that, that we see in some academic circles today, uh, ignores, you know. And so so the richness of that document and the breadth of that document and knowing, you know, Barbara and having talked about how it came about and what her politics were. She was one of the founding members of the Black Feminist Caucus in the, in the Black Radical Congress. Right. Uh, so we, you know, we've spent many times arguing and, and 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 bonding, mostly bonding. So yeah, so that's what I would say about uh, about company. Thank you. Yeah. And you stop asking me questions. Okay. okay. That was the last one. <laughs> it's hard being the top two of them. I'm just, no idea. just I'm just teasing with friends. Can I just also make a comment about identity okay. politics? Because again. Part of the issue with me, part of the issue, no, one of the issues that really stands out for me that I've come to understand as a person who's been an activist for 50 years, is we don't have control of the narrative in some important ways. What the things that we say that are some of the most powerful things will be misunderstood, misconstrued on purpose and otherwise. Identity politics for us, and I'll never forget the week that we talked about this before the writing of the statement, which was during the, the drafting. The reason we focused on identity was for the purpose of strengthening individual human beings to understand they had agency, a legitimate place in, in the, the conversation, that, they, that we had as black women the perfect right to be engaged in all of the conversations that relate to freedom in our community. So that part of that part of it as it relates to identity is like as a black woman, your identity should inform your politics. If you're looking at and, and again, I learned the hard way. For years I thought, there's so many black women that came through Compagnie, but were coming to the consciousness raising groups and not really hanging out with us after that. They wouldn't want to join Compagnie. I was pretty sure it was homophobia. Okay? Because you know, rampant, constant, still going on. I shocking. I had a moment in Central Square in Boston where I ran into somebody who I knew back in the day, black woman, older black woman, actually older, older than me. He said, I gotta tell you something, honestly, Danita. It really wasn't the homophobia, it was the communism. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I could say what I'm thinking, but I can't. We had a long conversation standing around in the Pete's Coffee, you know, having that conversation. And I, I just said, you know, I want to point out to her that, you know, it was the fact that we had a radical perspective on the economy and, and you know, the way we were talking about it. And I said, and we weren't communists, because if you had asked us, I had my, my violin teacher was from, from Ukraine. And I got an education about Russia. I wasn't even that fond to begin with, okay? Really, not at all. But after talking with Dr. Andrushko, when I was 14, I was like, oh, wow. I mean, there were things that I read a little bit of Marx, but had not really explored in any depth. And it occurred to me when this woman was saying this to me that once again, in the interest of not understanding and not sharing information and not engaging in dialogue, out of pocket, you just were like, no, I can't be around you because you're a communist. I'm like, I guess it's a step up. Because so many of you are virulent homophobes, so I, you know, this is a better thing. And yet, I'm still like, I'm not over that. I'm still like, we're an excuse. But having said that also, the other thing I would say is that I feel like we have very limited opportunities to commune with one another, especially now. With the ongoing pandemic, it's ongoing by the way, I know we all know this, but let's like, get into it too deeply. With the ongoing pandemic and the ways in which we're not able to deal with one another to build, 
I'm noticing some changes in interactions that are, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with this at all. I'm still really, I, the, I think the jury is still out as to where we really are with all of this. And so my interest right now, and I know this is like slightly off the subject, but my interest right now is here in Chicago, wherever I can go to have that conversation about how are we going to build on what we've learned in the last five years? How are we going to build on that? And, and I know we have short memories and, you know, like, you know, watching the, the dog, watching the butterfly, we're like that. But there are some serious things happening, creating schisms, more schisms within schisms within our communities. We can't have it. The left and progressive communities, we need to have as much communality as possible, given what we're up against. And so I guess I'm just going to say, I think, I think the whole thing about identity politics and seizing the narrative, that's also one of the jobs we're facing, is doing a better job of that. And it's very difficult in the system, in the system in which we live, controlling the narrative, so. Definitely. Yeah, and I would, you know, just to, to build on that, I did, who we are is important. It informs what we bring into a political space. It does not determine it. Absolutely. I'm just looking at, so this is going to be one of my questions to you all about kind of where we're going. Uh, what are the issues that you feel like we should be paying attention to? So we already mentioned really thinking about the lessons that we should have learned or should be learning about the pandemic, how we should be learning in community with you know, compromised folks. And for me, that's a question of disability justice more largely. Um, we've also talked a little bit about uh, the economy, thinking about poor people, which seems to sometimes fall out of the way we're talking and moving. So are there other things that you feel like Black feminists should be putting our attention to? I'm going to talk about the lack of economic the lack of economic analysis right now is really disturbing to me. When I see black feminism becoming more academified and more commodified, and I get I have young black feminists calling in and contacting me, wanting me to participate in the events that they're having. And I, when someone sends me a letter saying, we're going to have a gala, it's going to cost $125 per person, and there's no provisions made for childcare, sliding scale, I could go on. I was so appalled, I, and I'm not going to mention the person is well known, I'm not going to get into that part of it, but the reality is when I look at the, the black feminist organizations that are popping up and cropping up all over, the lack of an economic analysis, the emphasis on avoiding poverty, pretending like it's all over, and like it's too, it's just too uncomfortable to deal with, when in fact, it, when you start looking at the demographics of what's happening in the African American community, actually, we reached a peak 20, 30 years ago. And now we have more and more impoverished people because of the way the economy is evolving. So our lack, the lack of an analysis that really addresses that is concerning to me amongst black feminists. The other thing, too, that I that was the final thing I'll say is that it's, you know, I think it's really important the conflict between the academy and activists, which the National Women's Studies Association Conference is beginning to deal with that. You know, I think it's going to become something that becomes more discussed and talked about in these sites that are focused only on feminist organizing or, act or intellectual feminism. But it's very concerning to me that there is this enormous split where it used to feed one thing would feed the other. But now, because people are making bank <laughs> by, you know, using feminist politics as a way of entree into the academy, and then not really talking about like the, some of the fundamental issues that are related to what it means to be part of a radical movement, and I still think of feminism, especially black feminism, as part of a radical tradition. So I, those are my concerns. And I think one, I guess the final thing is just to remind ourselves that if the project has just begun, just because we're little teeny humans don't live very long, we're always like, oh, that's over. No, it's not. We're over. But the conversation is hopefully going to continue. 
And I'll be brief so we can answer that question too. Yeah. Um, I mean, two things come to mind. Uh, one is economics, and I think we should name uh, the economics. I mean, we live under racial capitalism. Uh, it's an exploitative system. It's in crisis. It's in crisis because of the very nature of capitalism. Um, it's, it's, it's an infinite growth strategy on a finite planet. So the climate uh, reality is something that 21st century capitalists are having trouble dealing with. The financialization of capital is another crisis that we have to do. This is a black feminist issue. This is yes. not a white economics issue. This is a black feminist issue because we live on this planet and, and we live in a world of life, whatever comes down. So the financialization of capital is another part of that crisis that we have a debt economy that keeps getting more and more people, especially people of color, uh, mired in debt. And uh, it, it, you know, it's casino cap. People call it whole number into casino capitalism. I mean, the biggest profits are being made off of not producing and selling commodities and not totally unexploiting labor. I know my Orthodox Marxist friends will, will, will shame me for that. Uh, and Marx taught us a lot, you know, but, but yeah, so did, you know, Bell is an old variety. But, um, you know, but, but it's coming from, from interest and from, uh, you know, from gambling on the future, from, you know, derivatives that, that actually, you know, put together uh, various uh, commodity, various, even call them um, various value items that uh, the value is very ill defined, and so and then people bet on that, and that's how they make money. So it's all very fragile. So I think that crisis is something that we should anticipate how it's going to be resolved. The other thing I'll say is the growth of, of authoritarianism and the threat of fascism. If Trump is elected again, I think we will see the unfolding, and I'm not happy with Biden either. I'm very unhappy with Biden, so don't misinterpret me. But, um, but, but what we will see unfold is unbridled fascism. And fascism has had different faces wherever it's appeared. Franco was different than Mussolini. Mussolini was different than Hitler. Uh, but we have authoritarian regimes throughout the world now. Um, and it is a way to resolve the crisis of capitalism, I mean, to, to force it down people's throats. And in this country, and this is how it comes back to feminism and, 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 and Black feminism in particular, radical feminism in particular, you know, is that the white nationalist movement in this country has a patriarchal misogynist component. It is uh, young white and also not white men who are being won to a violent movement, a violent redemptive movement to reclaim masculinity, to reclaim white privilege. And that is part of what's being sold in order to justify another set of policies that are going to repress uh, everybody. So I think that's what we're up against, and we need to get serious and rigorous about analyzing what we're up against. And I try to hold, I'm not like a half glass, half full kind of person usually. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm stretching for optimism, but I think we have no choice but to organize. We have no choice but to, um, to, to, to build and contribute to resistance movements in ways that we haven't before. And it can't be let a thousand, I mean, I sound a little rigid now, but it can't be let a thousand flowers bloom. It has to be serious, committed, disciplined organizing, right? And that is happening in places. And so there is, there is cause for optimism, but it's not happening in enough places. And sometimes we want to do what feels good rather than what needs to be done. So um, we're in a moment where we can barely do what needs to be done because they're coming after us with velocity. So. Not to be a downer, no, but no. just to tell the truth. Just to tell the truth. Absolutely. And Moya, what are you thinking about these days? Hopefully, you can bring us back up. <laughs> well, one of the things I'm thinking about goes back to your question of culture. And I'm thinking about how these white men that you're talking about are living in a world where um, the actual default, the less energy required, is the to default towards an incel white supremacist reality. It takes a lot of energy, I think, for people to move against the way, to move against the structure as it exists. And I don't know that people have easy entryways into organizing and resisting that narrative. So something that I'm thinking a lot about is what does that look like? Um, what are the ways that we can create more um, possibility 
for people who have the potential to be um, transformed um, and open uh, so that the, the path of least resistance isn't always towards the more hierarchical, problematic ways of being. So that to me has me thinking about what we create, what does our organizing look like, how does it feel for people, so that folks actually are willing to take the risk of being uncomfortable in doing the things that are hard and don't, you know, that don't feel good initially. Because there's value, there's more possibility on the other side. Mia signaled to me that we were five minutes out from Q&A, uh, and that was five minutes ago. So I think that, um, I don't know if the, have the cards been handed out? Uh, Are there, are cards handed out already? If people have questions, raise your hands and I'll give you a card. Oh, okay, so we're starting the card. Right? And I don't, I'm always passing up the Apple card, but we don't want to actually have people ask the questions to me. Question. Yeah. Keep them up until I get to you. Okay. So we get. So do you have another question or? Yeah. Well, people write their questions down. Um, yeah. A question for you, Bettina, is how. Okay. Good. I'm ready. <laughs> Speaking of culture, are and there, I was coming here thinking I, I'm just going to introduce. I know, I know, yeah. I know. It's like sitting up here. You can't just, yeah. No, my question uh, for both of you is: What are you seeing that has you feeling really optimistic? What are you seeing in terms of organizing? In terms of uh, what Black feminists are doing that is that is making you excited? All right, so I'm very interested in all the all the issues of anti-blackness that are worldwide. I lived in Puerto Rico. I speak Spanish fluently. The discovery of anti-blackness in Puerto Rico was a revelation. I had the experience of having a young lesbian friend of mine who was Mexican American call someone a nigger weekend. I know. I, I have many stories. People, I, I, is it just on my TV? Is it just happening in my life? What's going on? I have been completely fascinated always with the ways in which we try to build coalition and what gets in the way of that. In the Black Panther Party, that was my first experience in terms of dealing with an organized group that was talking about building a coalition across racial and economic lines. The shocking thing was when people were shocked that we fell out. But you can't have people who have an anti-blackness in their thoughts, in their culture, and how they're experiencing life, and then saying things like, I don't know why you're getting so excited about that. It's no big deal. So we had a lot of issues between African American, West Indians, and Latinos. Primarily, you know, at that point in Chicago, at that point, it was really Mexican, Puerto Rican, some Cubans, maybe a few. My my thing is that we're not having that conversation enough. So I, I developed a couple of curricula, curricula sections in a course I was teaching that had us exploring and talking about how anti-blackness as a worldwide phenomenon is impeding our growth as a species, okay? I'm working on, I, one of my writing partners is South Asian, and we just have a book that just came out published by University of Illinois Press. It's called Carceral Liberalism. I wrote the foreword, and Shereka Pillai wrote the, was the person who organized the book. She was the first South Asian person that I met here, met people from London and from South Africa, who articulated a way of talking about anti-blackness within her own culture and how that's impacted her way of building across those cultural lines. And this next year, we're working on a mutually held diary, and we're gonna write back and forth when we're sharing one diary and talking about our experiences as we raise the issue in the communities we find ourselves in. Keep watch for that space, because it's gonna be explosive. When back in the, back in the early the late nineties, when people were talking about the year two thousand being the year when the, the culture would become immediately more colorful, more diverse, and I remember saying, "But what about people coming here from cultures that have a culture of anti-blackness? They're coming to this country, which is like we're perfectionists with that shit. I mean, seriously. So what do you do 
when you meet up with people who bring that perspective and they're your manager, they're somebody who's a colleague, how do you have that conversation? Because we've had many junctures in our lives in America where African Americans and people from South Asia have come together. Harlem was one of them. When they had so many, couldn't, when, when South Asian women couldn't immigrate here, the South Asian men could, many of them integrated themselves into the life and times of New York, which included Harlem. And in the same way in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica and places where we've come together and remained separate at times and also blurred the edges. We need to talk about that some more because as we organize <coughs> across these cultural lines, it's going to be a, a deal breaker in many circumstances. It used to be just sort of not talk about it and just go along with it and not get engaged in deep conversation because there was no way to have the conversation that didn't end up in some kind of tumult. We have to learn that. I was trying to see a little bit about our podcast. Uh, <laughs> Jamina and I are going to do a podcast together called The Gathering Table. Yes. And it's an intergenerational conversation about black feminism and talking about all the things that are going on um, in different places. Yes. We've only done two or three, but you know, now that we've got to go with every arm, let's go. So The Gathering Table. Um, I know. Coming soon. So I have one question. I see a card over here to <laughs> you. And another one. So you can. You can uh, answer the question as I'm writing it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so never mind. Yeah, yeah. So never mind. But this one is this one has kind of been answered too. I will say. Um, what promise did what promise did or does the arts have for radical black feminist futures? Mm -hmm. I think we touched on that a little bit, but to partly answer your question. You know, there are, there are these amazing artists out here. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do with the Portal Project, which is a project of the Social Justice Initiative, I think maybe I mentioned it before, artists, activists, and scholars have been in two years of conversation about um, a range of issues. And we're going to have a conference here in Chicago September 20th and 22nd uh, that will culminate that whole process, but artists have been an important part of that. Tamina Masili, who is a Puerto Rican, Afro-Puerto Rican um, artist, Jamila Woods, um, and others, Christine, Christiana Colon. Um, Breathing Room is an arts, a radical arts collective and organizing space here in Chicago. Audrey Monet is a wonderful uh, movement poet who's been doing work around police violence and also solidarity in Palestine. So, you know, artists sometimes you know, both make us feel and move and, and have the confidence in the future that we can't when we're when totally sober in the real world, you know? Anyway, game us here. Um, Reimagination, dreaming, freedom, liberation. What movement or creation has been the most encouraging? Y'all want some optimism, huh? <laughs> Inspiration and optimism. You know something? One thing, I have a, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I have a good friend, Yamila, who's in the West Bank right now. And we're not, I mean, there's no, we, those of us, unless you have lived, if anybody in this room has lived through what it's like to live in a war, and I don't think we even understand what's going on in Palestine right now. It's beyond. Even people who are, engaged in the military. I have many military people in my family here, and some of them are very, very much you know, promoting Palestine. But I think the thing that's really tricky is that for us is that there's just so, the need for hope and the need for positivity, Yamila and I communicate on WhatsApp constantly. And she said, you know what? You have to realize that even though we're living in hell, in the purest hell you can imagine, we still like imagining you, Janita, making um, Baba Ganoush like you did that time. There is that thing that people who have been through the ultimate hell hold on to their humanity, which is my ability to remember the things that are delightful and wonderful, and you're not going to take that away from me. And that's really something that's been interesting, because sometimes when I was writing back and forth to her, you can't even say, how are you? What kind of question is that in this context? They, I mean, you can't. And so, what we've been doing a lot of is sharing the things that, that bring us joy and, and happiness. Because she said, you're the only person I can talk to right now who's not here, who, I, who knows me from that life. 
Um, just a brilliant woman who is such a humanitarian and dealing with a situation that, again, incomprehensible for those who have not been in war. We just can't know. So I feel like um, taking a lesson from her is reminding ourselves, she said, nobody wants people to be suffering. Least of all, people who are suffering the worst. They're not angry that you're not suffering. They're not looking at you and saying you should be suffering also. They're dependent upon us being human, fully human, having the joy that we can have that doesn't exploit others to strengthen us to fight that other struggle. Because the, the thing we also deal with, I think, is the grandiosity of some of us, and we're all guilty of it. I can't change the world, so what am I going to do? I can't make this huge impact. Do your little part. Do your little part where you stand and take notice of that. Join with others, be in communion, be in collectivity, to talk about and build for these things. Because one of the things that we're struggling with right now is extreme individuality, where it's all, I can't, I really hate selfies, I'm sorry. I know it's a culture that shouldn't do that, but I'm done. I'm done with the constant, like, sort of just looking at some. What are you telling me? Not you. I mean, I'm not talking to anybody individually, but there's a message we're sending to younger children who get in, they, they, they're immersed in a culture thinking only about themselves. And that's not the message I think we want to be giving to people in an age when we have environmental difficulties, we have political, and, and, and education. There's one more thing. Time to start the freedom schools again. I'm on, oh, I'm so on that right now because. When this young man who was in the class earlier today, he's a high school teacher, my heart went out to him because I said, nobody's reading. He said, no, nobody reads. We have a lot of repair to do with the young people that are in our lives. They don't have the foundation that some of us take for granted because we're coming up during a different time when just a different time. There's a lack of literacy and a lack of political literacy. We, are, we have learned a lesson now. See, when you said, you know, Biden's not your favorite either? No, hell no. None of them are. And I love that we sit around and we're like, you can be better. It's like, then why don't you do it? Who wants that smoke? Who really wants the way we run the system right now? Who wants to be president? Every time it's Michelle Obama, it's like, why would you wish that on her? <laughs> She's already been president. I'm, you know, kind of. <laughs> Nobody needs to have experience twice in a lifetime. And so when we criticize these leaders that we don't really pick, but we do, but we don't. As a polity, as a, as a group of people who, democracy requires engagement. It's not a, you know, every four years play a game and then keep, you know, roulette and keep it moving. And now we're dealing with the, the fallout of that because instead of people saying, you know what, you're trying to keep things from me and you're just, you're fucking up the, the picture and you're missing, misidentifying problems. Instead of pushing back and enter, you know, really being um, interrogators of what we're seeing, we're lost, we're stuck. The systems that operate that we live under make it very difficult for us to organize, to question, well, we need to be doing that. And I think freedom schools will really make a difference in terms of taking education back, bringing everything from the academy that's useful, stimulating intellectual thought, but grounded in this notion that we're doing this for the purpose of upsetting the dominant paradigm. That's our goal, because this can, is not sustainable. Let me get you involved in this. We have a freedom school here. Yeah. We have a freedom <laughs> school here, and then there's also a tradition in Chicago of um, in universities, yes. uh, which there was one before I got here, and then there was one that Lisa Brock and myself and others were involved in setting up. We went around to libraries that didn't have any money for programming and organized programming with mm -hmm. political education. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to pass it to Moya because you all sent these up here, and I'm you know, not the talk show host. But um, uh, what practices have you adopted or created that sustain you um, in the work toward justice? And then the next question will come from Moya. Constant constant, insistent inquiry. I've never going to be satisfied with the status quo or just the conversations that people are having that are just like general and superficial. What sustains me intellectually is the constant interaction between myself and other people from all different walks of life where I can actually learn something about what the world I live in and then bring whatever small piece that I have to offer in terms of we're doing it this way, but we could maybe do it that way in the other 15,000 ways as well. There's so many ways in which we 
limit ourselves unconsciously and consciously in terms of really expanding because I believe in speculative fiction. I'm getting bored. Like, how many planets? I don't want to go to another planet. I want to see what we can do down here to suddenly one day make racism like disappear. Like everybody wakes up and it's over. We wouldn't know what to do with ourselves, of course. It would take a while for us to figure out how to behave. But I think what I'm really concerned with is how can we really, as always, have real conversations about the real issues we're facing and be willing to be educated by one another. And I do mean that that is a two-way street. Because there's a lot of ways in which we are remote from one another based on issues of class, race, etc. cetera. I think we need to be a little bit closer in. This question is related. The analysis of the world in this country that's been discussed tonight is a bit overwhelming. For those who have desire to organize for change, what guidance or wisdom can you share about where to start? Make friends. The isolation that has become a way of operating because of social media in this world, just because there's like 25 likes on your post, see, thank you. Just because there's 25 likes on that post doesn't mean you have 25 friends. Nor are you necessarily in, in um, communality with these people. So trying to figure out how we're going to establish a new way of being in the environment that we find ourselves in is really important. You cannot cause a revolution as a single person. So you're good. we have to be in, in a communal relationship with one another, guided by whether it's philosophy, art, literature, um, revolution. We cannot do this a single time. So we need to really pay attention to that. And we've lost something in these last several years. Because a pandemic, we're not even good at it before the pandemic, and now we're like even more like confused. So I guess that's it. Yeah. Just to build on that, there's a question here. Thoughts advice on organizing and publishing across different language groups, and I think making friends who speak other languages and being in community with people who don't share your language going to events is part of how you build the relationships that help you get to a place where you can organize and also publish across those those divides. And I think, you know, to say self-critically, we, we didn't have translation at this event, we didn't have interpretation, but we have tried to make a priority of having interpretation. And sometimes people think, well, nobody asked for interpretation, but of course, if you, if you have it and you advertise it, people will come who are not, you know, uh, English language first speaker, first English, English as their first language. Yeah, so, and the conference that we're planning, a big part of that is in English. <laughs> right, Mia, right, Virginia? <laughs> There's a question here. Um, what do we believe about social media? Does it have a role to play in our organizing in this moment? If so, <coughs> what is to be done to counteract um, the way that social media plays a role? I am so deaf. I don't really know what the hell we're going to do with this situation. To be completely honest with you, it feels so wholly out of control on a certain level. I don't know how to get our arms around it because it, it, it's almost, it has a life of its own. And I, and its mother and father and its parents are missing. There is something about what's happened to us as the commodification and the capitalization of social media has easily lent itself to, you know, it just, God, I want to use this word so bad. The kind of fuckery that we see all over the place right now. <laughs> I really cannot tell you, I don't get a lot of hate at me because I'm not a public person in that way in the present moment. I think about the fact that all the stuff we went through with comedy as we were trying to establish ourselves and do the work. And we got so much negative feedback from the black churches, from the black heterosexual, the black, sorry, conservative communities, the black church communities in Boston, it was really pretty daunting on many days, and we never were going to give up. But that feeling of like, we're fighting, every time we turn around, there's some beef going on. I think I really want to say that we really, with social media, and I'm a social media rep, and the minute I understood what it was, I was like all in. 
But I had, like everybody else, crazy thoughts about how we could use this. Instead of being used by it, we were going to use it to do all these things. Yeah, it didn't work out that way. I like Bitcoin. So, <laughs> okay, if you have Bitcoin, don't be offended. <laughs> um, I still don't understand quite what's going on with that. But <laughs> does anybody know? Um, but I think what's really important in terms of social media is trying to figure out how to engage in like different strata because there, it's not just one level of engagement. So can we carve out space someplace in its universe that we can control enough? <laughs> you don't look very old. <laughs> Even with a mask on, I can tell you like that's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, it's, that's even a thousand because the truth of the matter is that is one of the features of the situation that we're living with is there is a lack of control that's planned. It's not, I mean, let me not even talk about Mark Zuckerberg using change at the same time we did, but no, this was, this was, the, the way it's happening is making too much money for it to not be just what people wanted. And there's enough space that all kinds of things can occur in the space that are sort of not controlled. Where can we fix it so that we can get control over some aspect of it? And, and almost like a guerrilla movement, find a way for people of, because we keep thinking it's people with like-mindedness. And I, I have to tell you, all my friends in epidemiology Twitter and, and COVID Twitter, those are my new best buddies. Um, it's interesting the conversations that are happening in that room because many of them are scientists who have been abused and misused and are looking for other people to have a conversation with where it's not going to be call, being called out of their name by somebody over nothing. So there are ways in which we can find one another, but I'm really, I, Moya is the person who, we talk about this often, I just don't know what we're going to do with this mess. I honestly say I have ideas, but they're probably not very sophisticated and very good ones. I just don't know. And if anybody has any wisdom to offer, please let me know. Because it's really out of control. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think we talked earlier about young people and how we sort of fetishize youth, you know, that young people are neither guaranteed to be radical or guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be anything. They're going to live longer than us if, if, if we're lucky, but, um, and, and have, <laughs> have more energy. But I think we can also fetishize social media, you know, that it's a tool. It's like microphone. You get on the microphone, it does a certain thing. Depends on what you have to say, right? So it can be manipulated, it can be use, I mean, we use, I've used social media to publicize things, but I, there's a positive, I mean, like I communicate with people in Egypt and mm -hmm. in Palestine and in South Africa that I wouldn't be in communication with otherwise. Now, in there, there's a lot of crap, you know. So I, I think, you know, not to, you know, it's not our deliverance and it's not our, you know, death sentence. So that's, that's how I would, that's how I would approach it. The last thing I'll say about that is check out the work of Allied Media Projects, a Detroit-based organization that's doing really positive work around how we use media in social justice. And they're thinking about this from a lot of different angles. And their idea of media and social media is very, very broad. Can I say one more? Like I said, I'm going to say anything. You can't shut me up. Um, <laughs> You know, I just started reading, some people may have been reading this book, Techno Feudalism by Janis Varoufakis. And it is not techno feudalism, it's not feudalism, it's actually still techno capitalism. But he does have an interesting analysis of how the tech billionaires are making the money. And Elon Musk is, you know, oh scary God. and dangerous. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of power, a lot of reckless power. Um, you know, in war zones, the satellite internet that he controls, Starlink. St Starlink you know, all the war zones throughout the world, right, use that. And and he and it's privately controlled. So, you know, very dangerous person. So I mean, I think Vera Fox's book is very provocative in that it makes us think in a new way about twenty first century capitalism, what the new technologies bring to bear in terms of what we're up against. That's all I was saying. And we need to stop fetishizing the rich. Let's just stop doing that. We talk about Elon Musk a lot because of all the shenanigans he's engaged in. But there's that undercurrent in our culture right now where the constant talking of millionaires and billionaires and how it's aspirational for the, for the, for, I don't even understand how we can think of that, but you know, the entirety of 
the communities of people who really want to focus on money being the way out. And I'm never going to be, you know, I come from, a, I'm from, I come from the marginal class, not the working class, the marginal class. People survive doing all kinds of things in my family. They want money not for the purpose of being powerful and being over other people. They wanted money to survive. And none of these people who have millions and billions have anything to do with survival. They have nothing to do with that. So I just feel like we need to start thinking about like not really spending that much time fetishizing them and always remaining in a critical stance to them. Always. They're not cute. They're not your friends. Or your little friends. So <laughs> uh, you all mentioned that during the Great Migration there was a sense of freedom that folks found by moving to northern cities. Have you noticed something similar in the present day? If so, what advice would you give to southern transplants in northern times uh, to begin to give back some of what we learn about organizing um, to our southern home community? Um, I'll start here because I'm a partner, and one of the things that I feel like this time reminds me is that the North is not safer uh, for marginalized people, Black or queer, and I think one of the things that's helpful is one of thinking about where Black people have a have the ability to create power and community is more the story than the South or the North. Um, Demina and I were in Boston. Some of the most racist things that have happened to me happened in Boston. I don't think that the North is somehow uh, a safer place. I don't know that I necessarily feel freer here than I felt in Arkansas or Atlanta. Um, but I do think that there's something to be learned about how people organize in different spaces and that there are site-specific site types of cultural values that we can take from how people organize in the South versus how people organize in the North that we should be paying attention so there's some cross uh, community organizing that we should be thinking about for sure. So I was an EPA lawyer when I graduated from law school, and it was in the 1980s, and it was when people first start, started talking about environmental racism, environmental injustice, etc. And the people who started the conversation were in Louisiana. And it was because of Cancer Alley and all the things that were occurring because of the petrochemical industry in that part of the South, as well as other industries which operated in the South with impunity because the South is anti union in many ways. And also, the even, I mean, the, it's interesting because the places where some of the worst environmental damages are done are places where there are sparse people. You know, North Dakota, South Dakota, you don't, know, you don't want to know what the Air Force has been doing up there. So when you think about the South has advantages to certain kinds of employers and certain kinds of people who want to do certain kinds of things, but the South also has always had a radical conversation going on about the survival of black and poor people. And the most important thing I learned when I was working at the EPA regarded having to be a northerner and standing for these women who were coming to talk to the EPA in Washington and saying, you, these white men who were the big lawyer types were very inappropriate and extremely, all, I mean, almost outright racist. What are you talking about environmental racism? Well, we told them, and they learned. And that's the thing I also think about the Southern message. There's no hair, like they say in Cuba, there's no hair on their tongue. They've learned to speak clearly without having any kind of, we're talking about the environmental movement particularly. And as it's evolved, it's still led a lot by women, by black women and working class people. So the South gave us that. The other thing I would also say, though, is that one of the things about the South that's, I, Charles Blow, the editorial writer for the New York Times, is trying to start a movement, which I'm like, I'm not doing that. More, black people should collectivize themselves in the South, okay? So we can have political power. And I'm like, 
Do you understand how the environment's working these days? You have to move someplace where you can't go outside in the summer. And you can't because the environmental harms that are happening in the South affect the poorest people, first and foremost. So, you know, I go back and forth because it's again, we're talking about an environmental situation that is going to continue to, until we decide to do something different, to devolve, to continue devolving. I don't think it's a good idea for us to move someplace that's crashing. So we have to try to figure out, okay, so I love the idea of collectivizing our energy and our political power, but we can't try to do that in a situation like Texas or Florida, dare we even say it, North or South Carolina, so complicated. We're almost at time. Oh. Uh, yeah, I know, the time flew. Um, but, uh, I mean, we can throw out the last couple of questions if they're quick ones and see if Demita wants to leave us with some parting words of wisdom. But we will, I think we'll be seeing you again because oh, yeah, I'm gonna be you're going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> but one question that I had is how do we recommend parents, nurturers, introduce revolutionary concepts and conversations to children? You don't have to answer that, but I mean, it's out there. It's a good one. It's, do you have any more? No, I think, okay. I think, you I think we covered, I hope we covered all the questions. You can either tackle that one or if you want to say something uh, in parting. Uh, okay, so kids, children, I have now little nieces who are grand nieces, and I'm looking at them and I'm like, okay, what world am I leaving? What are we doing? What are they being left with? And what's happening to them right now as middle, one is a middle, middle schooler and another one is only in the fifth grade, fourth grade, I mean. And I love listening to them talk because thankfully they're not really hooked on to Megan the, to Megan the Stallion right now. <laughs> I, I, there's things I just don't want to explain. <laughs> and, but all of that joking aside, for me with them, what I'm loving is that these are children who are being raised in a very religious, repressive environment, these children. And they are homophobic. They get their, I don't know where they're getting their feedback from, but they're just, I, I'm, every time they say something to me, I'm like, where did, you, I mean, where did you learn that? But it's amazing how refreshing they are. They're getting hit with everything, but they're starting to sort. I want to encourage that, that questioning authority, that questioning the dominant. They, they need to be strengthened to be able to speak also from where they're standing. We don't listen to our kids enough. I mean, I know it can be boring, and, right? But we don't listen, truly listen to them enough. They'll tell us in so many ways the things that they need to learn. So I'm, I love, I know, and I was a, a popular feminist who loved children and loved taking care of them and just loved being around them. I never understood, I mean, you don't have if you don't want them, don't have them. But don't be mad at me because, oh, you're just a nurturer. I used to want to punch people. I'm so, I'm very serious. There's ways in which feminism was practiced that was really like, what are you doing? Because we have to, all these children, be conduits for the best that we can do for them. And we fail them on a daily basis. We fail them when we don't encourage them to think outside the box, to not explore, to encourage their homophobia, to encourage their religious intolerance. But be that auntie, be that uncle, be that non binary aunt and uncle. Be that person in their lives, right? Be that person in their lives. Because those children are actually entering into a world where there's a familiarity with those differences now. And many of them are like, hmm, I kind of like that idea. Just the idea of opening up and thinking differently. There's a group of them like that are happening right now. So I have positive feelings about all of them. And I, the world is on fire, and the world is also still beautiful. It, it, it's, it's effed up beyond. In so many, we didn't even name all the places where it's hell. We didn't even, I have a good friend who's from Sudan, who's also dealing with the Congo right now. It's a, Haiti. Who talks about Haiti anymore, right? It's one or two people, right, exactly. I'm always bringing it up. Why are you bringing that up? Because, you know, we should be talking about it. But don't forget that there's beauty. And there's beauty in these moments when we commune and talk with one another. Take advantage of that. Be sustained by that. It's not going to be like manna from heaven. It's going to be a nibble and a bite each day as we go along and try to survive what's going on. And as we sit here in this cauldron called America or America, we still, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very screwed up situation that we have going on here. But we're going to bed at night, sleeping in bed, some of us, 
getting up in the morning and going to jobs, some of us, eating food every day, <coughs> we need to really start recognizing that the smallest things in life that give us sustenance, we need to be able to take advantage of and understand that's part of how we can sustain ourselves to be in the struggle. <laughs> I was just going to say to close out, if folks want to take a moment and just think about what little nibble, what little bit you're taking from tonight. Share. No sharing. No sharing. <laughs> but just hold that, hold that for yourself. Thanks. Thank you all for coming out. I want to thank again uh, Bettina and Lillian and Roxana and Rhoda and Julia for um, uh, all the work to make this event happen and get to meet it here and, um, and, and get you all here. And thank all of you for coming out. You could have done something else with your, with your evening um, when you chose to be with us. And most importantly, to thank um, Moya and Danita uh, for this wonderful conversation and for all of the work that you both have done over many years that brings what you brought tonight. And we're going to continue doing it. Yeah. Thank you.